ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for joining us here for our afternoon lecture. Our uh, speaker this afternoon is a revered producer, an MC, co-founding member of a group called Company Flow, and he's here all the way from Brooklyn. So please welcome LP. I am revered. <laughs> How are you doing today? Thanks for being I'm here. Good, yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of things to talk about. Um, but I, I like to start these things off with a little bit of music. And uh, you said this would make you feel uncomfortable. So I'm, I'm actually very much looking forward to Go playing for it. it. Um, you have some new music, actually, in addition to the things uh, I briefly mentioned in the introduction. And uh, this actually came out, what, just a couple days ago, officially? Uh, yeah. yeah. So... Um, we're going to hear a little music from LP and who's the other gentleman I'm on this track? I'm just going to stare at you while you listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Uh, who's the other gentleman on this record? Uh, Killer Mike. Okay. So it's me and Killer Mike. We have a group called Run the Jewels that we're, that's the current project. Mm -hmm. And this is a song. Okay, this is a song entitled Get It. Sanity runner. Any chance for humanity's landing on who the next up. Hope we handed them ammo enough to work from the neck up. Those who handle and damage control our wishes to best luck. I'm a living in smoke type. Floating with a grin over the multi. Happy island on you, bitch. I believe no hype. Closer to the edge than even we want to admit if this don't go right. Then assholes like myself are proving so right. All I got is this rap shit. All I want is a castle. And the move like a man with a minimum of harassment. Company of women with opinions and fat asses. That's my list of demands. You don't answer them, get the cat list. I'm stuck in a time capsule when rap was actually factual. Mean as shit you spit might cause killers to come and clap at you. Stupid, goofy, stoolie, the Gucci, and Gucci, and slap you. And that go for them cock kissing cats that's in the back. They all sweet as little Richard Dank. Good God of Molly. It make a nigga like me go woo and rob the park. I exit stepping with my weapon with the Jefferson walk. If you pressing any objections, you could get left in chalk. So my let a GD forgive my transgression. Well, one my being Catholic confesses, professing depression. I'm chin checking, chill, stressing on your butt, and I'm pressing. Michael, fuck a rapper's life up like Malik did depression. You know what? This is how I do my show, too. We got a big tour coming up. If you guys want to come see that for an hour, it's a big deal. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, this, particular, this particular track. And, uh, and I guess your, you know, your creative relationship with Killer Mike. I mean, you guys have done stuff in the past, obviously, but maybe a little bit background for some of these folks who might not be familiar with that project. Um, yeah, we, we did... Um, me and Killer Mike did a record together last year called Rap Music, which is Killer Mike's album. And um, 
we uh, we met through someone that we both knew who was at um who's was sort of heads up a lot of the creative aspects, um, especially the music stuff of um, Adult Swim on Cartoon Network and um, William Street Records, et cetera. And uh, he was, he's, you know, we both worked with him in different capacities, a uh, friend of both of ours separately. And uh, he had signed Killer Mike to do a record. And uh, he asked Mike if he'd be interested in working with me and he asked me if I'd be interested in working with Mike. And we both knew each other, but not, as much as we know each other now, we both knew each other's music a bit. I knew him from, of course, the Outcast songs and from some of like the, the uh, the Pledge mix tapes, which were sort of his post um, Outcast stuff. And um, he knew me from Company Flow, and he knew the name Def Jux, and and so. But he's he was open, and he, and, um, and 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 they flew me out. I went to Atlanta, and we sat in the studio together, and. Um, and I, after about three hours, Mike was just like, uh, so you're doing the whole album, right? And I was like, no, <laughs> not at all, man. And, um, and he was like, all right, cool, so you're doing the record. And I was like, no. And, um, and we just, but you know, there was something really, um, there was something really amazing about what happened. And you know, you, you for me, I've been around for a minute working with other people, and I've had a lot of experiences doing albums with different people. And you know, when you get to be in your 30s, you kind of don't really expect to be surprised anymore. You don't, you know, you've, you 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 have to fight against getting. Um, a, a, I don't want to say jaded, but 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 a little bit. Um, the idea that that a, collaborating with someone is predictable that you've done it. You know, and there's only a few ways that it can go, and you kind of know how it works. Um, and it's you have categories in your head, okay? Like you know, there's the there's the the difficult guy, <laughs> and, there, and then there there's the there's the you know there's the guy who falls in love with the first shitty version of the demo that you give them and won't let you change it. There's the you know there's the guy who thinks that he's producing and I'm just a mechanism for his you know and. Um, and you know you have you have different ideas and not, not not all negative of course but you just sort of think you know it's going to happen and and meeting Mike was um, and even on a, like a life level you know you get to a certain po part in your life where you kind of figure um, well I've kind of made all my friends you know I kind of know everybody that I you know there's not going to be you know you're not expecting at like 35 to like meet your best friend <laughs> you know um, you kind of know who your friends are. And I and, and you know so this happened and me and Mike just kind of were best friends, yeah. you know. And um, and so because of that, I said yes because, and I was in the middle of making my record. I was in the middle yeah. of making this record, Cancer for Cure, and that's the reason why I was saying no. I was saying um, because I had promised myself that I would finish the goddamn record because I'm really slow at making my own records. Um, so I went up there with that with the word no, like in my head like no and I was practicing it no I can't I'm sorry and um and I said yes eventually you know eventually he he you know um because if you know Mike Mike is just a you know it's really hard to say no to Mike he's just he's scary on record but no don't let that shit fool you he's like the cuddliest smiliest bastard on the planet and um and so we said yes, and I said yes, and we, and we went in and we did this record. Um, and we had such a great time, and we had such a great chemistry um, that it sort of led, you know, it led to a tour, and it led to a whole bunch of stuff, and we've basically been um, really, we both kind of felt like we had found um, a like mind, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, Mike had been looking for, Mike had been doing amazing stuff throughout his career, and he'd come really close to kind of blowing up a couple of times. Um, he was on Bone Crusher. I ain't never scared. He was on that. That was a huge hit. He was on um, Whole World by um, by Outkast, and and um, that went platinum, and he got a Grammy. And um, and you know, and still yet it didn't quite happen for him because I think that when he was doing his solo stuff, he he you know he ran into different things that he run into label troubles, different things. So he kept putting these projects out, and the projects were good, and, 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 and he was obviously really good, but Mike, from, his, from what he's conveyed to me, 
was looking to be produced. He was looking for, he grew up on a um, lot of the same records that I grew up, and we're the same age, and we grew up on records like, um, you know, we grew up on, well, a lot of the same records, but some of the records that inspired us when he started talking to me about what he wanted out of the project um, was, you know, uh, America's Most Wanted, you know, Ice Cube. Like, when, when, when Ice Cube left, I don't know, do any of you in here remember, are you old enough to remember when that record came out? You are the other ginger and the other ginger. <laughs> the three gingers <laughs> in the room. Well, <laughs> well, when that record came out, Ice Cube was known for NWA, and, and he was like the quintessential West Coast artist, and Dr. Dre was, you know, God and, you know, of the West Coast. And on the East Coast, the gods of the East Coast were the Bomb Squad, who produced Public Enemies records, you know, Nation of Millions and Yo Bum and Rush the Show. M most importantly, Nation of Millions, probably in Fear of a Black pa Planet, and... Um, so when Ice Cube had a falling out with, um, with you know, the whole camp, in, in the NWA camp, he did a really surprising thing, and he went east, and he worked with the Bomb Squad. And at the time, even though now we all look at it like a classic record that had to have existed, and, and, it, and it led to a lot of different things, but at the time, everybody thought it was crazy. Mm -hmm. At the time, it didn't make sense to anybody. And... Um, because me and Mike both had that history of knowing that that's how that panned out, that reference was really good for us because in our minds we were like, that's, that's what we can do. That's what we can accomplish with this. We can take people's expectations and, and flip them. And when you're making records, you, you're constantly, when you have like a, a career and it spans a course of records, you're not only fighting against, well, you're not only working with the idea of trying to make a new record that is relevant, but you're also carrying with you expectations. You, have, you are aware of and you understand what, how people perceive you, what they are um, thinking about music today, you know? And we kind of knew that, um, that us doing that record, even though for us it was very natural and it made all the sense in the world, we were the same age, we both we bonded over all these records and we have all the same sort of memories of, of hip hop unfolding and falling in love with hip hop. Um, we knew that that would play with people's expectations. Like it was, it was a way for us to, to um, fuck with people, and I think, and I and and make something that we thought would be great. And and I think that that was, you know, for that record, it was like, you know, there, it's not just sometimes about just making music. You have the music has to be great, but also you have to understand what you're playing against. You know, what 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 are you what you know what is the idea that you're putting out. Um, in, um, in the pantheon of, of, of the way that people listen to music, you know? And, and for us, you know, it, was, it unfolded exactly how we thought it would, which is that people heard that me and Mike were working together and everyone was like, well, that's just a fucking mistake. Clearly, that's wrong. So, sorry you're doing that. And, um, Mike. <laughs> and, uh, and, it, and, and, it, and it turned out that it, it, it worked for us and, and, you know, because people liked the record and, and so. But beyond that, we were really pleased. We had a lot of fun. And I've been through a lot of recording processes, and mostly my own, that are eh, miserable, pretty much, just, <laughs> just miserable. And, um, and that wasn't the case. So because of that, because of how much fun we had, because of how much we are genuinely um, friends, we kind of had this idea of doing it again, doing it more, keeping it going, and we didn't want to stop, right. you know? And so we came up with this idea to do this record. Right, so thus run the jewels. Thus run the jewels. Um, you know, it's funny though, because you, you talk about collaboration and that's kind of the whole sort of thing here is, you know, everybody in this room is from somewhere. Um, they don't necessarily know any of the people that they're going to be hanging out here with for, uh, you know, two weeks and there's a limited number of studios for them to go into and, and work on stuff together. So, um, you know, when, when did you realize that you and Mike were, you know, going to work not only as far as being compatible personalities, but that would translate to music. Um, it doesn't my always work that way, No, right? it doesn't always work that way. And, and in my experience, collabor like what you guys are doing right now is you're throwing yourselves in with other people and you're collaborating. And what I've learned about the, that word and about that process is that one of the major parts of a collaboration is 
um, the relinquishing of control. Um, it's not necessarily always about the perfect melding of your idea and someone else's idea. Um, you can make your own record, and it can all be exactly what you want and exactly what you think. And uh, yeah, of course you're the guy smoking. Can you pass that to me, please? I kind of do. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, son. <laughs> Then you inhale. Wait, push now. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little. Okay. Push. Uh, All right, fuck you. <laughs> Take your little purple fucking vaporize. Oh, oh. All right. Oh, it's a grape. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I saying? Uh, Control. But like, well, yeah. Control. I mean, you know, f forever, forever and ever, you know, I, I was making records, and, I, and it was always about um, my record, my idea, my thought, my life. This has got to be me. This is my statement. And when you collaborate with somebody, um, the biggest lesson for me was to learn how to let go of some of those things and to just realize not what you are trying to do, but what is happening. The thing that is actually coming true because you're sitting down with somebody else. Um, and that's super important. And in the in the in the process of 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 you know having different collaborations with different people, there are a lot of different ways that can go down. For for um, I felt very honored and very um, grateful that my my collaboration with Mike was of pure trust. You know, Mike decided that he trusted me, and and that gave me a lot of freedom. That that allowed me to guide him that allowed it be that allowed me to be a real you know contributor to what he was doing I, I i was not only just making beats for him and sending them and we we sat in a room and for you know several you know three months and smoked weed all day long that's important kids do that all day um and uh and we just basically, no, there were no managers and there was no, there was no one else. I mean, you know, obviously not everyone's dealing with that. But there, was no, there were no other voices and there was no other idea except two fully grown aging children uh, just trying to kind of make themselves smile and, and, you know, and, and do something that they knew that even, you know, with, with, with complete disregard for... Um, any like tropes that are popular or any ideas that, 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 you know, we weren't, we weren't um, playing the game of in, in, like, you know, of what everyone else is doing. We were literally just sitting there and seeing what, what was this? What was it that, that we did? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I think that that's maybe, that, that's maybe in my mind, the definition of a real collaboration, you know, and I've had, I've had, I've had plenty where you, th I thought it was going to be that way. And, um, and it wasn't, and you adjust to that too, you know? And, and one of the things, especially if you're a producer, one of the things you have to understand is like, you know, not everything that you do is going to be the realization of your artistic vision. Sometimes it's gonna be, you're a functionary to try and, you know, to try and um, help someone pull their idea out of thin air. And they may have, you know, depending on who you're working with, they may have more ideas than you do about, about, the, about the project. And you may feel like, well, why did you get me? Why am I here doing this? And, and, the, and the reason you're there doing that is because you, you have, um, if, if, you, if you're good at what you do and if you're learning how to actually be a producer, you have the ability to listen and to understand and to bring that out and for someone and to gently guide them. And then, you know, and then there are the ones that, you know, then of course there are the collaborations where, you, where you, you're like, all right, let's do this shit. And then you get in, you know, like, you suck. So... <laughs> Um, so wait, just, just, uh, specifically, did you actually, did you send Mike the stuff beforehand? Did you make the beats in his presence? The, How did it work? The Atlanta session that we first did when we first went out there was, the thing about working with Mike is that nothing happens without you being there. <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, we, the record took probably a total of three months 
over the course of nine months, you know, because nothing was happening until we were in the room together. Um, so no, it wasn't one of those things. It wasn't one of those like we're emailing beats, he's sending me back verses or anything like that. Like if you're not in front of Mike, it's just not even existing. It's not there. And 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 that was actually cool because really what it was was him saying, This record is ours. Like we're doing this together. And so it didn't happen until until we were in the room together. Um, yeah. What um I guess I mean I, I kind of feel like we should play something from big from uh, rap music, um, just to sort of maybe even contrast what you did for from Mike as opposed to what you do for yourself musically. Uh, is there anything in particular you want to hear from that or? Um, I don't know. What's good? Um, uh, I mean, Big Beast is the is the. Yeah. What are you guys in the mood for? Like something that's really going to make you uncomfortable, or something that's going to relax you a little bit? Uncomfortable. Okay, cool, cool. Um, all right, yeah. Why don't you do um, Big Beast? That's all right. That's yeah. Here's a good. That's one. the worst to sit to just sit. And Hard to G shit, homie. All play around, ain't shit. Sweet like the peach. This Atlanta clown, home of the dealers and the strippers and the clubs, though. Catch you coming out that magic city with a snub, ho. Lurking in the club on tourist motherfuckers. Welcome to Atlanta, up the jury, motherfucker. These monkey niggas looking for some loot in Jermaine. And all that nigga found was the Ruga and some pain. Wow, motherfucker, wow, come up off the chain. Wow, motherfucker, wow, one off in it bright. We some money and hungry wolves, and we down to eat the rich. Your bodyguard and shit, we strip them like a stripper bitch. These real ass killers moving silence with violence. The minute it's set off, we the motherfucking wildest. I am from Atlanta, that they never speak a pun. Well, everybody got a sack of dope and a gun. Yeah. gun. And you gun. know just how it go. go. We ain't around with that bullshit, nigga. We ain't let that shit go. When you come in, you better go correct. Once upon a time in the projects and OG saw a young Bumby as a prospect. Thought that I would understand the streets from a very young age. So he opened up the G code to the front page. He sat me on the porch, said this where little dog sit. Pointed at the yard, said that's what big dog shit. He said don't leave till your ass get grown. And don't come back till your ass get cold. Whatever you want is whatever you can have. Bring the pain and leave them wet like they soaking in some salve. When you step out on the app, make sure they wanna see ya. Cause being drill is an automatopoeia. Be about it like a G. I hate them, wanna get you slipping. Drop to be a Jordan or settle for a pippin'. Player, I ain't even trippin'. But I don't really care cause my pistol's in your face. So put your hands in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know yeah. just how it go. We ain't around with that bullshit, nigga. We ain't let that shit go. Good fade. <laughs> so, Big Beast, Killer Mike, featuring Bun B, uh, and T.I., yeah. and Trouble as well on the hook. Um, so, something like this. Would you say this is a, is a departure from the stuff that you would do for yourself, or... How would you categorize it? Nah, not that much. Not right. really. Okay. I mean, to be honest, most of the music that that I make, um, in some way or another, a lot of the music, let's just say, is is started with the idea of me making a song. And you know, whenever I'm sitting down and and, and making music and starting something, you know, this 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 in some form or another existed before Mike. Right. It finished. You know, it changed and it became Mike's. And um, and um. So, you know, whatever, you know, one of the things is like, there's a balance, you know, one of the hardest things for me to learn was that I wasn't making my record for somebody else when I was producing for someone else. It was like, I had to make someone else's record. And, um, and, I, and that meant I had to give them a sound, I had to tailor it to them, I had to make sure that when, um, again, that it wasn't just my, me fighting for my idea, you know? Um, but no, I would have rocked on this shit. In fact, I didn't even want to give it to them. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of beats on the record where I was like, "All right, you fucking bastard, you can have it." But but um, but they don't live and they don't they they're not they're they're not records until you know until they're claimed and you know that that it's like they're claimed by what what whoever's saying whatever they're saying and the way that they're doing it and and they get altered and they get changed for that person and you know a lot of the records a lot of the songs on the record were made in front of him you know um, with him. But that one in particular, no, I definitely would have 
kept that. Well, how, how did that process of working on that album with Mike, you said that you were hesitant to do that project because you were trying to finish your own album. Did that in any way help your process? Because you said, you said you're, the process of you making your own albums is typically, in your words, miserable. Um, did I say that? Yeah, it, um, it did help. Yeah. It did help. It did. I, I didn't... Um, you know, it kind of came at us, you know, I gave myself up to it. I was just like, you know, and, and, and making, making a record with him was just so much more fun and so much more easy than working with me. I suck to work with. <laughs> He's great. Um, me sitting in a room alone, high again, all day. I suck, you know, I'm the worst. Um, Mike, mad fun. So it, it, it definitely energized my shit. I was probably about halfway through my record and, um, and, uh, Yeah. I went right back into it after finishing up his, and it, it gave me a lot of sort of energy for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we ended up putting both records out within a week of each other, which was kind of crazy and unheard of. Yeah. wasn't really planned that way, but it just happened that way. So, um, I guess you know. Well, I guess we should talk about. We can talk about the album then. Um, I do want to go back at a certain point, but with Cancer for Cure. What uh, what was your mindset? I mean, you've you've done three albums in your own name, solo projects. Is that correct, or four? Four. One is a three, three. Um, and you know, each album, of course, is a representation of you at whatever stage in your musical career and life. So I guess with this one, where what kind of stage were you at? Uh I would say that it started a, in a bit of a rough phase, started a bit of a rough patch. Um, I had a, a very good friend of mine who I, you know, worked with and, and lived with at certain points and um, who was very much a part of my life and uh, who passed away uh, prematurely of, uh, of lung cancer. And um, that kind of threw my world a little bit. Um, it, it sort of was the first domino that led to a lot of changes in my life. And um, um, so that's where I was when I first started writing the record. Um, and not that the, that, that the title honestly doesn't have anything to do with that, but I'm sure that the word was rattling around in my head a little bit. Um, but uh, so, you know, these records, it's, these records, the reason, I don't know, you know, it's when I do my records, they're a little bit different for me. You know, I, 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 um, I try and take a really accurate snapshot of not not who I want to be, but who I am. And that can be a little bit tough. Um, just because A, you want to be honest about it, B, you want to you want to understand it. You know, sometimes it takes me a while to get these things started because I don't really know where the hell I'm at. And, um, you know, all the time. I can't really be bothered to constantly take, you know, um, a snapshot of, of, of whatever the hell's going on because you don't know. And if you're, if you're, if you're, but when I, when I, when I delve into these records, a lot of times it's my, it's this somewhat grueling process of kind of trying to let the, the voices, you know, kind of speak, not, not in the, not in the sense of, um, like I said, in the, not, I don't want to be the voice of the person that I, I wish I was on, on record. Mm -hmm. I'd like the, I'd like these records if possible to be the voice of who I am. And if, and if you, if you pay attention, um, and if you're, if you're, um, as serious about getting the details down emotionally, um, then in some ways, if you're as true to yourself as you possibly can be about who you are at the time, then you may be able to capture how we all are at the time, you know, you may be able to capture something that someone could look back on. You know, I mean, look, if you take a photograph of a person on a corner in 1976 and, in the, and you're focused on the person, you're still going to catch all the shit in the background. And that is, that is not just a picture of a person. That's a picture of the world. That's a picture of a place um, and many people. Um, so I want that. I want to be that. I want the, I want, you know, when I, when I write these records, I want to be honest and, and I want to be as detailed as I possibly can. Not, not in the sense of literal detail, but in the sense of emotional detail. And um, I don't think that we're, we're not all these incredibly unique snowflakes that our parents told us we were. We're actually not. And we all kind of feel and experience the same shit. And 
slightly different lenses, slightly different perspectives, but there's nothing that any one of you in this room has felt that the other person sitting next to you hasn't felt in some form or another, vice versa. And I think it's important, that's, that's something I realized. You know, I used to, when I first started making music, I was really just about being a rapper. I was really just about saying that the coolest shit possible and the funniest shit and the, and the hardest shit. And I still do that, I still like that. But I grew a little bit into a direction which I, when I started to realize that, you know, bec backtrack, at that time when I, was, when I was doing that, younger, I thought that if you got too detailed about your own personal existence that you would lose people, that it would be too um, self-indulgent, you know? And, um, and I realized that, in fact, it was the opposite. I realized, in fact, that the, one, the songs where I thought I was just simply just writing about me were the ones that people would come up to me, you know, and, and, and have real feelings about them. So, you know, I started to get addicted to that. I started to want to, I, start, I started to realize that because, you know, all you're doing is tapping into something that is intrinsic in all of us. And, and if, you know, if you're tuned into that, no matter what the details are, mm -hmm. No one's going to share the exact details, but they will share the experience. So um, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> well, please guide me. We're, well, you were you're, you were talking about just where you were when when yeah. So Secure. so again, where I was when I did this record, I was where I always am, which is oh fuck, I got to do another record, you know, and. Um, and what does that mean? Who the fuck am I? What am I doing? What's the right, what, what, you know, what am I trying to say here, you know? And um, you can overthink that shit. And um, I am a great overthinker. Um, but ultimately, you just get over the hump and you just start just saying shit. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, hopefully you tap into that stream. You know, you kind of keep saying it and keep saying it until it just starts right. coming out. Right. Um, but I, I thought I was in a really dark place with this record. Um, and... Um, it ended up that I didn't feel that way. At the end of the record, it ended up like I felt like, um, like I had written that actually that I felt differently. You know, mm -hmm. um, it started with the death of a friend, and 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 I and I thought that I was feeling very very um, uh, jaded. I was feeling very hopeless um, and just kind of heartbroken a little bit, um, tired. And I ended up at the end of the record, I ended up feeling kind of like that I had rediscovered something, um, you know, that, that actually, that I had discovered something about myself that I didn't really remember or realize, which is that I do, that I'm very hopeful, that I'm very romantic, and that, and that I have um, a lot of hope, and that I don't think that it's all fucked. Mm -hmm. um, and, that I, and, and, you know, it's interesting that you can kind of like, you don't know, you know, for me, I never really know what the hell is going on until I'm done, and I can step back from it, and I can look at it and be like, oh, that's... That's how I feel, but you know. And who is who is your friend who passed? For those uh, who may not be aware, Kamuteo. He was an artist named Kamuteo, um, and uh, actually put out his posthumous album. I put together and put out his posthumous album a couple of years ago. Which, for anybody who's interested in you know production or, or or vocal techniques or anything, which should really check out, is called King of Hearts, and. Um, it's very raw because it's mostly comprised of his demos, you know, the stuff that he did on GarageBand because he was basically just too sick to finish the record. Um, but it's pretty mind blowing, and you know, for, for and especially when you consider when it came out, um, he was he was doing things, approaching production and doing vocal stuff that people weren't really doing yet. That maybe even sound a little familiar now, but at the time were not. Um, but he also has shit that no one's ever done and no one ever will do because he's a very unique person. Um, but yeah, that was Kamuteo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and his voice is on one of the uh, tracks from the LP. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should we hear a little bit of that? Just taste sure. of that? Okay. This is something from Cancer for Cure entitled The Full Retard. Pump this, pump this, pump this, pump this. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit, pump this shit, pump this shit. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit, pump this shit, pump this shit. Got a screen, a container, a 
purple rays hobby. Walk with an army on me. Talk by the harm and all the posse. Probably got me on a radar with a dotties. Watching, plotting, minions out of lower god scene. Shit hawks the brown in a town of bullet dots. And I'm a Rocky. Run a hundred mile before my coffee. Shitty little sick at the grip is hitting. But don't know now I'm verified. Signal lift, verified, bossy. Fuck your boy noise. Boy, boys, no employ. Oi, oi. I'm grumpy, kick the shit at your groin, boy. Oi, play. Slayers of your harmony, porn life. Don't fuck your lucky day, the flight of a torn cop. Holy smokes. Kitty blown to the bone and death server. For the hurts, for the burner. Whip to the church, a murder sermon. Just the Cassandra to drain the painfully worded further. Future of a gerbil, a bass, a mass. Cause that's my word up. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit like they do in the future. So you should pump this shit. Did you tell her off? Is it working? I did, so. Oh, okay. Right. We're playing all the really punishing songs <laughs> for some reason. Like it just worked out that way. I mean, I think um well it's you know, I think it's good we played this particular track, not only because Camus' voice is featured as the hook, but also um you know, I think it's a good example of what you've done, you know, throughout your career, which is you know, you're known for um, you know, for lack of a better word, a, a progressive style of hip hop. Um, you know, it's a vague word, but I'll use it. Yet, in a, at its root is something that's, you know, pretty much grounded in the hip hop you came up with, you know, in the 80s. Um, some of the records that, you know, were super influential to you. And, um, you know, you can even hear it in the stabs in a track like that, you know, which is probably going to be familiar to anybody who's heard hip hop through the 80s, that sound may not be the exact sound, but it's very, it evokes something that's very, very much of that era. So, and I think that's one of the things that's, you know, at least for me as a listener, I've always got from your music, both, you know, what you do on your own and with company flow. So um, I guess, you know, just going back, you know, what was your introduction to hip hop and uh, how did you get involved in it? Um, I mean, it was just, it was like anything else. I mean, it, it, I think like anyone else, I was just a kid. I just heard it. I mean, I lived in Brooklyn. Um, the uh, I would listen to like, you know, Mr. Magic's radio show, and I would listen to like Marley Mall, and I listen to Red Alert, and I, you know, just these basically just discovered it through the radio, and through um, and through, you know, at the time there were actually boom boxes. <laughs> people people actually walked around with gigantic sometimes with record players in them, boom boxes, and people would just, you know, bump the shit in my neighborhood, basically. And I, and I, it, it was just exciting music to me. I mean, at the same time, I was listening to Devo and Talking Heads and Prince and Michael Jackson and Run DMC, Fat Boys, you know, um, LL Cool J. When, 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 when the Def Jam stuff started coming out hard, that was really when it cemented it for me, you know, um, Beasties and, and Cool J and, and, um, yeah, and of course, then later, you know, the, that whole era. But you know, I just, I just learned about it. I heard the music just from hearing the music, and I just loved it. It was just, it wasn't even a question for me. Um, I didn't understand what hip hop was. I didn't know what that was. Um, but I would ride the train every day, and I would see graffiti all over the trains. And as I got a little bit older, I would start. I started meeting people who, you know wrote the graffiti and then it would be like oh this is this is connected you know the music and the graffiti are connected and then i'd be like i see people dancing i'd be like oh that's part of it too and you know it, it was a natural thing for me growing up um I, but i just i did it just because i was a fan i did it just because i just liked the music i mean you know for 15 years i didn't even write a word down you know i would just um i would just stand in front of the mirror and rap you know, runs part, you know, and, and, you know, I would listen to the fat boys and I would listen to, you know, whatever, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't deep. It wasn't any, you know, it was just simply that I just loved it and I just kept doing it and we would joke around. And as I got older, got to be a teenager, we'd spent most of my time when I should have been in school being high and drunk and listening to rap music and, and, um, just f started freestyling and started, you know, trying to write. I mean, I actually, I wrote my first rhyme when I was 10. 
I have it framed on the wall because it's that good. And <laughs> and um, but uh, but that was all in the style of the Beastie Boys. You know, at the yeah. time it was the Beastie Boys. When I, when I wrote, rest in peace, Adam Yacht. It was his anniversary yesterday. And um, but yeah, man, it was just it was natural, and there was no like huge reason, no huge catharsis. It was just simply that. I just had fun doing it, and then I, I and I, I don't know for some reason I was just I was the kind of guy who wanted to try to make it, you know. I, I, um, I had a, um, I, I had a boombox, and it was a, you know a tape deck boombox, and you could record tape to tape, and and we would make these things called pause tapes, and that was, you know, a lot of people talk about them because that era that was a lot of you know a lot of producers who kind of come from the same era I do. Um, started that way, which is basically you're just making tapes, you're making blend tapes. And what you would do is you'd pause, you'd, you'd pause the tape and rewind, you know, some, basically someone else's record, let's see, it's, it's Peter Piper or whatever from Run DMC, and then you, 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 you would just loop it essentially by doing, you know, a pause and a, and a record play edit. So I would do that and I got good at it. And then people would bring songs to me and they would ask me to remix them and I, I would do it. I would chop them up and I would chop shit up and I would make these for my friends. I would make these edits, and then I started recording over them. I started rapping over them, and that's really how it started. I mean, it was nothing. It was nothing too, you know, specific. It was just sort of this long, slow process of me just having fun and wanting to and wanting to get more and more into this. You know, wanting to like, I had heard it and I had loved it, and, and now I was recording. I was listening to it, and then I started remixing it, and I, I just wanted to get deeper in. I just wanted to see how how can I be a part of this. You know. And what did, what did mom say when you were just spending all your time doing this and not going to class? Um, what did she say? Well, I mean, I got kicked out of a couple of high schools by the time I was 15. And basically my mother said, um, either learn how to be the guy who doesn't have a, you know, who doesn't have a problem being in school. Or she said, or what the fuck do you want to do? And I said, I want to do, I want to be a rapper. And, uh, which is what every white mother wants to hear. And, um... <laughs> And uh, to her credit, you know, to her credit, she was like, okay, well, then you're not, you're not going to just be a rapper just like that, are you? You're going to have to learn how to, and I said, well, I don't know. And she said, well, here, go to this. And there was this, there was this musical engineering school so I, uh, the, called Center for the Media Arts in, in, in New York City. It's not there anymore. Um, it was on 26th and 7th, I believe, or 25th and 7th. Um, and she said, if you're not going to school, you're going here. And so I said, fine, fuck it. And it's, at 16, I went to um, musical engineering school. And all of a sudden, I was in you know, a facility that would be the approximation of this type of place, just much less nice. And, and um, I was around you know, a bunch of 25-year-olds and a bunch of 30-year-olds who were trying to become engineers or whatever the fuck. And, um, and, uh, but that's where it started. You know, that it was like all of a sudden I was I was doing what I wanted to do. All of a sudden I was I was involved in music every day and I couldn't turn back. I was like, I can't I can't believe I haven't been doing this shit, you know. Um, so that's where it started. So how did you uh, how did you actually begin recording your recording career? Career or, well, or just how did you recording? Make a, how did you make a record? Um, well, I made a record uh, through through the school that I went to Center for the Media Arts. I met a couple people. Um, one of them was friends, and I, I met I met I met someone named Lou Lou Louis Ballantyne, who's still a still a friend of mine, and um, from Hollis Queens. So I, he used to take me up to Hollis Queens because he was like he would take around the white boy that could rap. You know, he was like I've got this white boy he can rap, and he'd take me up to Hollis Queens, and from there we ended up hanging out with um, uh, a bunch of people from. And Hollis Queens is where Run DMC comes from, it's where LO Cool J comes from. Um, and we were just hanging out with people up there, and through him, I met this dude named Antex, who had a record on Tough City Records, which is a legendary shitty record label. And um, be careful, you might just get sued for saying that. Yeah, I mean, you know, but put out kind of cool shit, but just was a crazy label. And him and this guy who worked, the accountant who worked there, which is insane. Who for anyone who knows about Tough City, um, started a little indie record label, and they and and you know. The, the guy, you know, signed me or whatever he wanted to put up. So that's how I'm, you know, that's how it happened. I, and um, it was, that was 1993. I put out my first record through this little indie label that I had, you know, 
um, hooked up with through the guy started it went while I knew him and um, that was the first record I ever put out and I was in it was called Juvenile Techniques in 1993 and um, I was 17 and um, you know it was it was all right. <laughs> I don't know. It was okay. I thought I was a. I, I was like, okay, so cool. So I'm a rap star now. That's good. That's great. And uh, then you know, I kind of between and that was under the name Company Flow. I hadn't met Just yet or whatever. But between that, between that and 1996, it was mostly just trying to learn how to rap better, trying to learn how to record better, um, going up to you know radio shows cl and freestyling and getting my rep out there and just you know becoming involved in the in the in the culture that was happening in New York City of of, of people who were unsigned and and you know blah blah blah. Well, I mean that that you know that record even got some support though. Right? I didn't got didn't it get played um, on some of the some of the shows. Uh, did Stretch and Bob play uh, Juvenile Techniques yeah, yeah, a little bit? Yeah, Stretch and Stretch and Bob Beto does. You know, which was um, a big part of my career and a lot of other people's careers that are that are like platinum now. You know. Um, yeah, they played it. Yeah. They, they they were the first people, one of the first people to play it, and then um and and we kept that relationship going. Bobito was like really supportive, so was Stretch, mm -hmm. and I just kept going back to them when I started having new music. They just had the door open for me. So so how did the 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 unit of company flow that people are familiar with come into being then? Well, I mean, we me and Mr. Len, who's my DJ at the time, who the DJ for Company Flow, we had already. We had already all known each other and were hanging out. Um, just actually worked, was friends with the guy who started the label and and worked with the label. And then he quit the label to work with me on the music. So, you know, it was, it was, it just happened not long after we did that first song. Yeah. I kind of pulled him in. So. Yeah. Yeah. So 1996 then is when the original Fun Crusher EP yeah. is released. And were you surprised by the reception? I don't know anymore. You know, you kind of like remember things the way you want to remember them as the person you are now. I want to be like, yes, we were surprised. <laughs> but I don't know. I was pretty cocky back then. I might have thought I deserved it. You know, I might have been like, of course. I, but, but, you know, we, but nah, I mean, you know, yeah, I think we were. I don't think that we had any idea. We were surprised be, m more as we went along because there was at the time the internet really wasn't playing a role as, as you know in right. music or anything like that. It really wasn't, and so you kind of didn't know. You had no idea if people liked your music. You had no idea how many people liked your music. You had no idea who was listening to it. We started to get surprised when we were doing shows and and there were lines around the block and we were like we didn't have, we had no idea you know. Um, so. But we also thought the music was good, you know. Yeah. So like we 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 expected people to like it just because we were we were cocky and we were young and we were, and we liked it and we considered ourselves you know the ultimate hip hop fans. So, you know, what I mean, what was your uh, I guess what was your what was your mindset in making Company Flow Records? You know, when you guys started out as this this unit, I mean, it was the first. You know, it was it was just to prove ourselves. It was just yeah. to get in. It was just to, it was just the it was just to make our mark. We just I wanted nothing more than to be a competitor and a player in the realm of music. You know, I had I had spent my years being a fan. I had spent my years learning and and trying to perfect it. And you know, no one heard my music. No one heard my demos. I didn't. There was no put it up and let everyone hear it shit. You know, it was like if you wanted something to come out, you had to work on it to get it out to more than just your friends. And we wanted that. I wanted that more than anything. So the the you know and I just had a lot of attitude. And so it was that was it, man. I just wanted to show everyone that I was the nastiest, you know. Yeah. In my head it was like I want to prove that I'm that I that that I can that I can hang and not only hang but that I have something to contribute, you know. But it wasn't just that. Though. I'm saying also musically, you know, what you were doing was different from you know the kind of traditional boom bap that was coming out in the mid '90s. And yet, people would call what we do now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I guess so. But it was, it was. It was I different. Mean, yeah. yeah, it was. I mean, it was different. We wanted, you know, I believe that. And I don't know how this applies to other people, but in, but you know, hip hop culture is interesting because there's a musical aspect. You know, there aren't a lot of other cultures that that have more than just sort of 
you know, different producers in different cultures, I don't think they have a similar history to hip hop because when you're doing hip hop music, you're coming at it, at least we were coming at it from the perspective of having an ideal about what hip hop was and I, an I ideal about how you were supposed to hold yourself, how you were supposed to contribute. And I, and I, and you know, growing up being an admirer of, of graffiti that worked its way into, into our art, you know, and I had learned that in my mind, what, what I had learned was that, um, it wasn't about, it wasn't about doing anything. It wasn't about the, the safety, the guarantee of anything. Yeah. It was about the risk, you know? It was about, um, it was about style. And, and you never wanted to sound like anyone else. Yeah. You just didn't want to sound like anyone else. You wanted to make sure that your shit didn't sound like anything. Um, so, and, and what we believed that the, was that it, it wasn't about sounding like things that were already proven that to the, but it was about make invoking like you said earlier it was about invoking things we wanted it to be the f most fucked up sounding shit that made you feel the most hip-hop ever you know and and you know we wanted it to feel the, like the purest hip-hop shit but it also be completely unfamiliar we wanted it to be ours 100 percent. so that's kind of what we went for that's that's how it happened you know, and also, of course, you know, you're just sort of like at a place like it, the sound has just happened because of where I was in terms of mm -hmm. my skill level. You know, all the right. little mistakes and things that I didn't know allowed for something to sound weird. And know? just what was going on in, in hip hop at the time, too, just as a, either as 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 something to aspire to or as a foil. You know, well, yeah, as going. a foil for sure. You know, I mean, for us, we felt the whole shit was a foil. We felt like we were chomping at the bit, like, fuck all of you. We're, you know, that was our that was our idea, you know, and, you know, you don't keep that same mind state as you get older. You don't keep it forever. But yeah. that's what we that was our mind state then. All right. Let's play something from Company Flow. Get like Rwanda, don't wanna fall or get trapped up. Quick to rush the spotlight, maybe you're and get mopped up. Tax that spray your hall with rap ever saw. Organized graffiti that just and can't control. Or level with the devil, wasting up town, first the board of patchy. I'm much too much for any demon style to master me. From the throcks, neck race to the hell's gate. Lyrically detonated, sparking in maybes and bottle rockets into nigga chaser. Damn town graffiti to face a herbal in the base. Open up the eyes and clean out the name. Wide open like the Grand Canyon. MCs couldn't hang if they was lynched by the Grand Dragon. Searching for my styles like Jopor. Coming home or work release, shoplifting at the rap store. But sabotaging me ain't easy. I'm crooked like Nathan Windstorm and Asko Cheesy. With a big face, fall back, you get ball like De Niro. A sandwich still ain't nothing but a hero. Just a small sample of the abstract. When the rhyme get crazy hot and lyrics don't know how to act. Whether shooting joints or wax. I go all out and attack crabs and herbs that's crazy whack. We all can't be pimps and we all can't rap. You got to get your dollars on cause it's on like that. Here's what I want you to do, niggas with the green axe and burgundy forerunner. And human like Blade Runner when I'm rhyming all summer. Just listen to the drummer. Transistor blister feedback, freak the impedance. Bunk mode, we expose frequencies and see when napalm can drop low range like Baba Optic. Check the rhyme activity, your skills is microscopic. To my crew and my nigga LP who's here to spark it, causing all these crashes. Check it, man, flicked it. Quads on our 50 lungs, misty. Color me Maximilian, cause I'm that crazy robot teetering on the edge of outer space, spitting buckshot the black hole surround me. You found me. As far as I'm concerned, I got your asses in the urn bigger. The temple meant to hold them board, kid. What's your confunction? Tracks is tight, dusty. Drinking water out the well of life, man, I'ma piss it back, rusty. Flesh and phonics, you goddamn right. I'm on it like a order pacemakers hooked up the clappers. Clap off. Welcome to my free form, Jubilee. Look at me, they witness to the shit you wanna be. DBA, lyrical P, bonus and sip, but I'm a psycho fan. Feeding on fat, fast and dip in and out of mind, your visible state. Born on a rep, tyrannical. Rex like text, bust mechanical. Rusty gone a weasel, printing beats on an easel. Shoot ahead of what bitch, your boxing shadows. Look out my way, you pull the breath out your battle. Breaking your double helix, and now this shit is single. Not mono, I burn the needle out your funnel. LP the third runner on the grassy nose. Roll, keep the seven seal of heaven in my pocket. 
you faggot like sprockets. You motherfuck the Houston Rockets. I'm so sick of my psycho metaphors. Bet, but I fuck Laura Ingle. Only when she's done with her chores. Got rappers tiptoeing on the highway. They haven't got me. It's like Bruce Banner when he's stressed. I'm sick of you. Corny beach in your crowd and ball hooks. Cause I'm a thinker. Evil ain't is letting off stink. Steps to perfection. Yeah. Some are each part born to octagon. Let rhyme stop be smart. Steps to perfection. The sum of each part forms the octagon. But rhyme styles get smart. The holy terror. Last move you made was an ever won't win. Play it to This is starting to feel like a this is your life type of vibe. I know, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, try to keep it moving. But this, uh, this, you know, this in turn, um, you know, got you guys a lot of exposure, the CP. Um, and you wound up um, putting out the extended version, you know, through Raucous. Um, what are your reflections on that time now? I mean, I know you've been outspoken about it in the past, um, but, you know, do you still feel the same way about that time, that era? I mean, it was, it was a... It's a time that people who came up during that time and were hip hop fans, a lot of them idealize, hold very near and dear to their hearts, the raucous era, the mid 90s, you know, New York underground hip hop era. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't feel the same. I, I, I think you're probably referring to like how I felt about raucous. At a certain point? Well, I guess it's two things. I mean, you know, your, your thoughts on the era in general, you know, but in addition to that, you know, you, you yeah, your thoughts on Raucous. No, I mean, it was, a, it was a special, it was, it was undoubtedly a special time. I think that there was a lot of energy. There was a, there were a lot of um, great artists that were putting records out. There was a lot of um, non, there was a lot of unexpected music coming out and there was a lot of, um, you know, it was great, you know. I mean, I look back on it like um, I was just—it's my life, you know. It was—it's—it's it's such a big part of my life, and it mean, means so much to 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 what I do now. Um, in the sense that, if you know, I was lucky to be there. I was lucky. I was lucky for to be a part of it. I was lucky to be um, to do, you know, to have some success in in, in in that in that era is really what was my introduction to to actually being a professional and putting records out and having that be a a, a real thing. Um, so it was great. I look back on it with great reverence, but I don't look back that much. But when I'm asked, I, I, I have nothing but positive sort of feelings about it in general. And even, you know, my perspective on Raucous has softened. I mean, I had a little bit of, I was pissed off by, with Raucous when I left, but then again, I was in my early twenties, you know? Um, so it's changed a little bit. I've, I've, you know, I, I then went on to do a, my own record label for ten years, and now I kind of get how hard it is. And it was like, you know, um, so I don't quite have the same like, you know, fire and brimstone sort of like. But you know, I don't have that really for much. You know, I kind of it's like, you gotta, you kind of gotta be pretty important to get the, the angry guy these days. Um, so that that's not. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I look back on it. Um, very thankful that I got to know some of the people that I got to know and got to be around and see some amazing things. And, um, and at the same time, it never, I don't, I, I don't, I don't idealize it. I mean, I'm always sort of looking forward to the next thing. I, I've, I've always kept, I've never felt like I was, um, did my job yet. I never felt like I was done. I never felt like, you know, there's a carrot hanging in front of my face at all times. And I've been pretty much just chasing it. So I don't, and I guess I'm lucky to say that because there are, there are some people who that, you know, that's where it flourished for them. And then at that period was also sort of the, the period at the end of their, you know, their statement. I was lucky enough to be able to go on and be able to do music and have people still let me do that. So, um, but it was great. It was, it was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, the thing about um, that era also is I feel um, that... It was thought of as a movement by so many different people, and it's been kind of, you know, history writes it as a movement, and yet right. there's also something that comes along with that. It really split, in some ways, the audience, 
into a real us versus them type of mentality that we kind of still deal with now. A little um, bit still deal a little with it. Bit. I think it's faded quite a bit. And I think that a lot of that perception was, it wasn't the artists. It wasn't the rappers. It wasn't Company Flow and Most Def and, you know, Farrell Monch and, yeah. and, and, you know, and shit Eminem and fucking, you know, and everybody who was involved in that. None of us were thinking in those terms, but it was, um, yeah, there was a, there was, a, it, it happened to coincide very naturally with what, you guys go to a hip hop show, how, do you guys listen, go to hip hop shows and shit, does that ever happen in here? No, you're all just looking at me, cool, why am I here? Um, well, if you do go, it's not very dangerous, it's not very scary for you people. And it used to be, <laughs> and it's not really anymore. And so a lot of the artists that 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 were making the music, um, um, that were even on Raucous, myself included, we we witnessed a, a, an audience change, yeah. just like everyone else did. And we 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 didn't we weren't familiar with it or used to it, but we kind of just took it as it came. And it was like, well, okay, well, if we'll take whoever shows up to a degree. Yeah. I think what happened, the reality of it is, is that. And I'm, thank God, I feel like that's kind of it's kind of dying now, if not dead, to some degree. Was that um, because of a confluence of different things, in, in, including the way that um, magazines were reacting to it, the way the the the, t the types of um, press that were paying attention now to the the scene, for instance, were raucous or whatever that would never usually pay attention to hip hop and whose readership were a different demographic than hip hop shows normally were, started really paying attention to it. All in all, what happened basically was that people started to feel like, more I think based on, 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 on a perceived change in audience and the way that it was, the way that it was um, um, sort of, I don't know. Uh, there's a change, and I think that people reacted to that, and there was a, there was an uncomfortable sort of us and them vibe that grew out of that, I believe, and it was it was, you know, and 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 it was magnified by you know sort of um, magazines and you know it, you know. Well, it's a story that people latched onto. It was a you know if you're thinking 1997, you know when Fun Crusher you know um, plus comes out on Raucous. You know, it's representing musically something that's theoretically, diametrically opposed to what else was going on in hip hop in 1997, which is, you know, the quote unquote shiny suit era, you know? So that's an easy right. story to tell from a media perspective. Right. And then you had these kids being like, independent as fuck, suck my dick, world. And, you know, yeah. and, you know, I, <laughs> it was. But that was it, your slogan from it, a 12 that they championed. Yeah. And no, know? no and doubt. They, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, that slogan was created at my kitchen table when we were drawing our right. album artwork. And I just was like, we are independent as a motherfucker, right? Like, you know, it was more of just like a joke, you know, like, holy shit, we're independent. <laughs> like, I didn't know you could be this independent. <laughs> and, and, it's, <laughs> and it's great. And, uh, you know, but yeah, man, you know, I, I reject all that. I always rejected it. I never felt comfortable with that. I don't believe in um, I don't believe in that. And I, uh, in in the idea that there, you know, subgenres and genre. I mean, when Company Flow came out, we were right up in the source. They just put us in the source because we were hip hop. <laughs> and then it changed, you know. And then it was like, you know, KRS One was, you know, rapping over our instrumentals on on Tony Touch mixtapes. It was like, you know, Pete Rock was playing. In, uh, I mean, uh, Primo was playing our shit. And like, you know, it was getting some Hot 97 spin. And it was like. This was what it's a pretty what was, special was, moment. Yeah, man. this it's is like, what was supposed yeah. to happen. This is what we thought. We were like, "Oh, we're on Hot 97. Okay, cool. So we're about to be, you know, we're about to blow up." And you know, um, but I reject. I rege always have rejected. I never felt that it was really. That I never really liked the uh, the subgenre breakdown, the divide, the idea of that. And you know, I spent a long time trying to just ignore that, you know, and just do. Yeah. You know, for me, it was just like, well, look, you know. You guys squabble amongst yourselves as to what it means. I'm I'm just doing this music like I was. I'm a ten year old kid who wants to be a rapper. So, you know. I mean, that, yeah. I was gonna say uh, that baggage has got to be frustrating because you've had to deal with it for, for a while. You know, even through you know your solo work, people have sort of, 
we'll have an image of what LP is about. Yeah. You know, and say, well, company flow, independent as fuck, you know, this and that. And thus you, you know, you cannot listen to a record on commercial radio and enjoy it. Right. I, I can't tell you how many times people have told me I don't like Jay-Z, you know, where it's like, oh, cool. That's cool. Then why do I have all these records then? But, um, you know, whatever, man. You know, at, at the end of the day, it, it seems to have kind of faded a little bit because people know me at this point. People know that, you know, for me personally, and just speaking for myself, I'm much more complicated than that. I was never that. That was never, you know, I wasn't necessarily, you know. But, you know, for my thing, it's like, look, on the one hand, at, even at the time, I was like, on the one hand, I hear you. On the other hand, man, this is what I want to do. I'm just happy if anyone shows up. And I don't think that the blame can be put. You know, it's like, I think that we all kind of fucked ourselves a little bit by thinking about that a little bit too much. Because at the end of the day, people are, now I've been around for a while and, and I feel like that I've, I've been very glad to see that I think that that's dissipated. I think it's legitimately dissipated because I think that there are no real lines anymore. Everyone's working with everyone else. Everything's li everyone's listening to everything else. And it's just sort of, it doesn't really, it just doesn't work in the, in the way that people are talking about music. It just doesn't really work that well to break shit down into, you know, um, you know, and that's when you get records like me and Mike are, are great records for that group, you know, where it's like, well, what can you say about this? Is this your, is this one side or the other? You know, is this a, um, even when I did the Cannibal Ox record back in the day, that's how I felt, where it was like, what can you say about this? Here are two kids from Harlem, you know, and they're, and, and we're making a record. This is music, you know, it's not, there's no, you know, the fans aren't saying like, uh, I'm mailing it directly to white people, you know, yeah. like, Give me a list of every white person in New York. <laughs> I'm going to send it directly to them. Tell them to come to the show. They're welcome. But, uh, you know, so it, 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 was a big, it was a big part of the conversation for a long time. And I always kind of stayed out of the conversation because I was just kind of like, you know what? I don't, I, I don't really care. I don't really need it. It's not, I have this thing I'm doing, you know, um, and uh, that's all. You, you mentioned, you know, having a little more perspective from doing your own label for a number of different years um, and seeing how difficult that was, you know, what was involved with that. What else did you learn from that process? Never start a record label. <laughs> if you gave me a million dollars, literally right now, I would not start a record label. Um, but I learned a lot, you know, man, I learned a lot. I'm still learning. Um, I'm really glad I did it. It was great for a long time. The biggest thing that I've learned is, is that you have to, um, Never let a creation of yours, an idea of yours, a plan of yours become something against your own will. You know, I mean, like, you know, you can think an idea is what you want and it can work for you at the time. But you have to listen to who you are, where you're at. You know, you're not doing anybody a service if all of a sudden you've created something that you're not as behind as you used to be. You're not as interested in it. For me, it was a big and an important and difficult decision to stop doing that record label. But I realized that I wasn't... Um, in love with it anymore. I didn't, I didn't enjoy the process. I was, I, I had my eye on other shit and I felt like, well, I I'm better, better to rip the bandaid off now and take some, take a little bit of flack and disappoint some people than to ultimately string them along and really fuck with them, you know? And, um, you know, um, I guess that was the thing. That's the process for me. The process has always been like knowing when, knowing to when to allow yourself to change and, and, and not having this sort of idea that um, because you dug your heels in on one thing at one point that, 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 that you have to follow through no matter what. I mean, it, you know, we're all making music here so that we don't have to do anything that we, we don't want to do. Like, that's literally the point. If you're here, you know, for any other reason, then I don't relate to you. Um, but I do music because I don't ever want to work a job. I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to be told what to do. I don't ever want to be told what to say or think. Um, I don't want to ask permission to have fun. I don't want to ask permission to be fucked up, you know, or apologize for it. Um, you know, and that and that's the that's the thing I think that you have to remember. You know, we we go from music to big plans because you know and. The plans are great and everything, but just remember that, that those only exist because of the music. Those only exist because you want to do music. And when you get confused about the plan, just remember that that was secondary. Just remember that that didn't really, 
that wasn't what it was about. You know, it was it was the thing that drove you to make music that that you have to tap into again. And I've I've had to re tap into that a few times in my life. You know, so it's it's a, it's an interesting lesson to remember, not even learn, but to really have driven home. You know, later. You know, so um, on the on the um, the notes for Fantastic Damage, your first solo LP, you list all the equipment you were using at the time. Um, why did you do that specifically? Because I barely was using anything. <laughs> and I just, and, no, nah, you know what it is? I was a record collector. Yeah. Like any good hip hop producer, you know, you, you, you collect records and you look at them and you read the instruments that are on. One of the ways that you collect a record is if you look and you go, oh, Moog, you know, uh, you, know you, you just look for all the things that you sort of learn that, that, you, that you like. Um, you know, you see harmonica, you avoid the record. Um, <laughs> it's very simple. Um, and, uh, so I kind of wanted to, that was my homage to, to, to be, to record collectors. You know, you open up the shit and you, I, you know, I wanted people to, 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 to see that even, and to imagine it because that's how I used to do it. You know, I'd look and I'd just, it, it was crazy to me that that was, the people were playing things and that were, you know, it was like they were listed and cool. And then when I, you know, when it came time to make my records, I was like, what am I going to, I'm just not going to. I'm just gonna say rap record, <laughs> you know, like wasn't made, it just happened. Um, and also there was, it was cocky because I was like, I'm making this and I only have like one piece of equipment. <laughs> right, so, I think there was only know. one piece, one, yeah, one sampler on there. EPS which... 16 plus, you know, and Sonic EPS 16 plus and like a Keyboards. fucking turntable. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you were using back uh, from the beginning, right? At that time. Yeah, yeah. What about now? What's what's how is it how is it uh, augmented and and been and progressed? It's it's gone way further than that, definitely. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, and I think that you can hear it in the way that I do music. And um, yeah, you know, as 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 you know, as I've gotten gone along and learned more about music and been more involved in music, you, you're constantly want more. You know, I guarantee that everyone in here is probably a gearhead to some degree, and or at least like you know, on the verge of it, and. Um, you know, it's a new toy. You just when you when you fall in love with something, you want every weapon at your disposal, and you want to learn it. And you want to. So I've gotten you know, gone much further with with what I do now. You know, and to the point where the EPS 16 plus, you know, isn't even really the biggest part of my. Oh, keep it real. Oh, yeah, fuck my. Um, <laughs> isn't really that big a part of what I do, to be honest. Well, I mean, as you evolve, you know, you aspire to do different things. And exactly. those it's tools not... have to change as well. Exactly. Um, yeah. Was there a moment where, you know, the Sonic sort of, was there a kind of a Sonic jump for you at any point that you noticed on your own stuff between Fantastic Damage? I'll yeah, I think the Cannibal Ox and... record was the beginning of a bit of a, a, a like a like an idea realized. Mm -hmm. I had started to move into more melodic stuff. I mean, you know, the Company Flow shit and uh, was much more just it was just raw and there wasn't really too much melody or 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 involved. Not even really much composition. I mean, sometimes we would just rap for eighty bars and just be <laughs> like, say something at the end, and that was the song, um, which was what it was. But yeah, as I got as I got more and more into it, and you know, I wanted to. Cannibal Ox was probably a turning point. I think that, um, I think that, um, well, really, Little Johnny from the Hospital was the first time I started really changing, um, and that led to what, how I started to sound on Cannibal Ox production-wise, and how I started to sound towards Fantastic Damage, and and um, because I was the first, be, because no one was really doing like hip hop groups weren't doing instrumental albums. It was well, Rockus wasn't exactly happy about that shit when we were like, here's our next record. There's no raps on it. Um, and they, uh, it was kind of unheard of at the time. I mean, there had been instrumental records, but not from a group that's a rap group, you know, you're not, right. but that was the first time that I ever had to make beats where I all of a sudden didn't have words and I didn't, you know, have the ability to say what was happening in the music. I had to actually make the music sound like something. I had to make it sound like it had a structure and make it sound like it changed and there was a point to it. And that, yeah, I think that that sort of opened me up a little bit and kind of sent me in a direction, you know, towards where I am now, which I think is, um, I'm, I'm very much far away from where I was before in terms of what I think I understand about music. You yeah. Know? What, uh, what are your, what memories can you share of the making of that um, Cold Vein album? I mean, this is kind of one of these projects, you know, early on in the Def Jux catalog, you know, in the history of the label, but... Um, really set the tone in some ways uh, for a lot of 
a lot of things that came after, but also I think it's just one of these things that's really, uh, you know, a defining record of that decade. And, um, you know, people probably increased in stature by the fact that the guys never followed it up. But what are your memories of that process and what it was like? Um, it was it was good. I mean, that, that I moved. They basically they moved into my crib. I had an apartment in Brooklyn, and they moved in, and we spent a year kind of just living together, being friends, and trying to make music. And um, it was great. Um, it was the first time that that record came about because I was just traumatized from Company Flow. Basically, Company Flow broke up. And I thought that company flow was going to be my whole life. I thought that was like, okay, company flow, we'll, we'll just do this forever, and that's cool. And and um, that didn't work out. And I was kind of sick of, I really wanted to make music. I, I was sick of, I didn't want to make an LP solo record. You know, I wasn't ready for that yet. In my head, I was not thinking in those terms. Um, and... Uh, and I just heard these guys, and they were amazing. You know, I heard them on a on a mixtape that was this group called the Adams Fam, and they were just so vortal and vast, were just incredible. You know, these voices, these and and they were weird and 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 but great and and really um really raw and really relatable. And um and I'd known them, and they had opened up a few times for a company flow different places and as Adams Family. And I and I approached them, and I said, well, "Do you guys want to form a group? You know, do you guys want to?" And I, I, if you do, I'd love to produce it and put it out. And um, that's that's how it happened. You know, um, I just really felt passionate about those guys, and I just really thought that they had something, and I wanted to pour myself into a project that that had nothing to do with me, and. Um, and that's how it happened. You know, we just sort of went headlong. It was just a good, it was good timing. You know, I think I, you've said at one point about the making of that record and your production that you were going for, you know, moments of beauty as well as sorrow. Is that an accurate still, you know, is that accurate to you still in terms of how you hear it? That's accurate in terms of how I look back on my whole relationship with Cannibal Ox and the whole thing. Moments of beauty and sorrow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just the truth. Um, but, uh, yeah, they had a real sorrowful and beautiful perspective, you know? I mean, these guys were talking about being pigeons, and and they were, they were talking about what it felt like to be this dirty, abused bird that could fly. <laughs> and, you know, I just thought that there was a real, there's real poetry and beauty to, to what they were saying and, and the way that they were approaching really relatable shit, New York shit, being in, you know, the same places that, that, you know, a lot of other people who make records are in, but their perspective on it was not, they weren't, you know, they weren't excited about it. They weren't sad. They were just alive, you know? And that really meant something to me when I was listening to it, and I thought it would mean something to other people, and I wanted to help encourage that coming out. And um, and that was the whole point of, 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 of doing Def Jux. I felt like um, I wanted to put out... Um, I didn't want, I never thought that Def Jux was the solution to, to music. I wanted to contribute something other than I wanted to give a balance. I wanted to have, I wanted something else to be out there. And I thought that there was room for that. I thought in my mind, I thought that it was needed because I was basing everything off of what I wanted out of music. And I need everything. I need it all. I need shit to dance to. I need shit to relax to that you don't even listen to the lyrics and you just, you just hang out. And I needed shit that was going to upset me. And I needed shit that was going to make me, um, you know, um, get angry or get sad or, or something, you know, I, I, and I saw, you know, I thought that Cannibal Ox was a really amazing intro, you know, way to, to set that off. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought, I think that those guys are, um, you know, made something really special because they are, they're special people who have a very, very, um, sensitive and real you know perspective you know and um and that but that was not otherly it wasn't someone else it wasn't it wasn't outside of hip-hop and that's everything that i've always been about you know i always believed in that i always you know 
I really believe that the reactions and going back a little bit to what we were talking, I believe that we're our own worst enemies sometimes and the way that we, we tell ourselves what our music is. We tell ourselves what, what it should be. And, and, but we don't even, you know, how long have we, how long has anyone been doing this? Like, you know, you don't even know. And, and, you know, I remember those guys getting upset because they were being told, you know, the perception was almost like people weren't listening to the music. You know, there were people who would listen, who, who just picked up on an idea and rejected it. They didn't actually listen to the, and, um, so I, I, you know, I, I've, I look back on that record and that experience, you know, fondly, really fondly, and I'm glad that I was uh, uh, allowed to be a part of it. One of the things, um, you know, you've done through your solo records as a storyteller is adopt different voices, um, you know, and different personas or different characters to tell a story. But what is what is your goal in doing that in terms of not just telling a story, but relating a point are these are these characters people that meant to represent you in some way fully or are they just ideas that you have that are out there that you just want to you know speak through that particular voice i think both i mean you never fully you know you're never fully who you are on the record you know don't know rappers who he is and if he is you know then that's a different story but i mean no artist is what they paint, you know, no, you know, but, but the painting doesn't exist without them. It's impossible for it to exist without them. The characters are, are always me, but, but it's just, it's just emanating from me ideas that I have that I'm working out and things that I'm interested in and, and that come from a real place that come from a place of, um, of my, my life, my, you know, my mind, my heart. But, um, but I'm not married to that. I don't have to be it. You know, I don't, I, I don't make records that, you know, that, I don't believe that a record has to be you. I believe a record has to be your record, <laughs> it has to be your idea. It has to be your, it all emanates from you. You know, there's no, um, there's nothing that is not allowed. And so, and, and that sometimes is the hardest thing to remember. Mm -hmm. When you're making music, the hardest shit sometimes is that you don't, it's hard to drive home in your head. Like I can do anything right now. There's literally nothing that I can't do right now, except as limited by my talent, you know, or my ability to, to, to wrap my head around it. Um, and that's hard, you know, that's, that's it's, it's, it's a hard thing to keep remembering and keep reminding yourself. And whenever I get to a point where I forget that, I just think about Camus and what he did before he died. Because when, because when Camus was sick, um, and this was a rapper, I mean, Camus was the nastiest rapper on the planet. And I'm not just saying that because that was my boy and he's gone like he is, in my opinion, one of the best rappers ever to live. And he was singing. <laughs> he sang, you know, he started singing. And it was like he just did whatever the fuck he wanted. And this was a guy who was dying. And it was like, all right, so the dude who's dying is not giving a flying fuck and making this insane music. And that's, I just remember that every time I'm like, you know, every time. And so the characters, you know, the characters are not, they're not always me. You know, a lot of times they're way, like, they're way more fucked up than I am. And I'm pretty fucked up, but I'm not that fucked up, you know. Um, and these, and these, you know, these things are just ways for me to just go and examine all the shit that if I didn't have this art, if I didn't have this outlet, the way that my mind is and the way that I've always been, if I didn't have the outlet, it would just be much worse for everybody. <laughs> you know, like it would be bad. I'd be, you know, naked with a brick in my hand. <laughs> or, um, but, you know, now I just I'm naked sometimes. I'm sorry, that was uncomfortable. Um, no, nah, but you know, so no, I don't have any. I don't have any like rule about that. But but. You know, I guess, you know, you talk about different shit that I've done, like, you know, st something like Stepfather Factory or whatever is obviously directly out of my childhood, you know. And those were the types of songs that I started writing a little bit later where I was like, it was a new way to approach it, a new way to talk about shit where I didn't have to really say, oh, hey, by the way, I watched my mother almost get beaten to death. I didn't have to say that. I could inhabit a character and come up with an idea and, you know, Maybe that's maybe it's just because that's easier for me. Maybe it's easier for me to talk about shit that way. I, but you've already, I mean, but you already you already told that story too. You know, that's in a right. very in a that's very right. direct yeah. way. I did, I did, and that was my first. 
attempt at saying anything about myself ever, you know, like in, in, in music. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first time that I had ever been like, you know, hey, f the rest of it was just like, a, I'm the best. And, you know, and then, then there was that song. And that just came, and that was like, you know, that just changed me, I think. It changed me. I want to open it up uh, for any questions anybody might have for LP. We have a mic. <clears throat> I don't I don't like the looks of this guy. <laughs> He's up to no good. Uh yeah, simple question. Just like want to know what what your process is when you when you sit to write songs. These days, I wake up around 8 o'clock, make coffee, roll a joint, sit in front of my computer, play a beat, smoke. That's about an hour. I don't write anything down. Usually just scroll through the internet a little bit. <laughs> get up, go outside, get another coffee, maybe a bagel if I'm feeling, you know, saucy. Um, but, you know, it, it, basically at this point, man, it's, just, it's like there's no, there's, I spent all day walking around writing bullshit down. Anything that occurs to me, I just write it down in my my phone or whatever the fuck. Um, but there's no writing for me unless I'm sitting in front of music. Like it just doesn't happen. Like and let, like there's no real writing. Music and, and, and like producing and rapping to me are now 100% integrated. Like I can't, you know, um, I'm not writing something and then trying to find music for it. It's 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 definitely the opposite. You know. Um, and it and you know these days I'm just I'm, I'm I've been really trying to just just go with um, I've been trying to go with a, with cadence. I, a, a lot of times I hum a cadence to myself, or I'll even listen to the song and record a cadence into the phone, even just mumbling, nah, 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 you know. And you put it in it, because a lot of times the hardest thing is not is not the word the hardest thing is is not is is capturing the 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 feel of the of, of the thing and 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 to me what i've learned is a lot of times my first instinct is the best instinct but the problem is is that you're not writing your first you know your first instinct is rhythmic mm -hmm. you know your first instinct is is this your first instinct is not con conceptual and and is not literate you know so i do what i can to record the rhythm of an idea because I know that that's the thing that can slip away really easily. And, and I'll come back to it and I'll listen to the rhythm and then I'll try and hear, from there I pull words out sometimes. You know, I, I hear you know, words and the pattern. And then of course you deviate or whatever, but that's something that I've learned in the last, like, I would say four years or something. That's, that's what I've been doing a lot. Word. Rakim said, he, Rakim said he did something like that as well. Yeah. Who else has a question? For LP. No, you fucking suck. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Well, what one of the things with um I, I don't know if that's like the latest uh of your work, but one of the things I noticed is not just hip hop, but a lot of like rock or even like I wanna see metal, but like noisy stuff in it. You've only like mentioned your uh hip hop thing. Uh What's uh, the other, I mean, is it like listening to radio or do you like all? Well, I mean, I'll put it to you this way. When you're a hip hop producer, you probably have more records than anybody else in the world because you were collecting records to try and find samples. Oh, you know? broad spectrum and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the influences that come, you know, from, I mean, we listen to more different types and genres of music than any other type of producer. I believe this. And we know more about it, and we have references for it in our head, and so yeah, um, you know, all I very, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm influenced by a shit ton. I don't I, I don't think it's really healthy to be influenced just by the music that's in your genre. I think that that's yeah, homogenous, and that just ends up being like it just ends up having these sort of predictable results. You know, all you're doing is faking inspire you know faking a reference <laughs> you know it's like you know so yeah i mean um and i've done a lot of work with a lot of rock bands and i've yeah, done a lot of other types of records like and stuff you know um and you know i've worked with you know people like you know beck and mars volta and 
Trent Reznor and yeah. you know just a lot I've done I've gotten a chance to do a lot of different shit and it's because it's it, you know I think it's I think it's because that element does kind of come out in what I do people hear it for in different genres of music people hear something that they identify with what it is that they do but I, I really just think it's because I have no um, criteria it's like everything I'm just constantly grabbing I used to sample records now I sample inspiration i sample ideas i sample things i remember you know i sample um uh, uh feelings you know I, I'm, I'm trying to capture something in my way that i hear on a record that i loved you know um but not literally anymore so yeah i'm i'm i i like to think that i'm a pretty i've got Mixing a pretty wide a scope yeah yeah i mean you know but that's what hip-hop is man i mean period like yeah that's, but definitely like the uh a lot of a well a lot of aggression in like that uh, limit thing, but you can get like that whole aggressiveness. <sighs> and what in some of the certainly songs, the songs we played were pretty yeah, one note, like, like just punch note. you in the face. Shit. Yeah, yeah. I've got <laughs> I've got other types of songs too. No, no. I don't know what they are, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I have other types of songs. But yeah, you know, I, I, I'm I hope it shines through. You know, I mean, I think that I think that um, I've always been like that that's just always been me I, i personally have always pulled from you know everything that i've ever liked and i and i never i never really had a criteria as to what i like because i couldn't because when i grew up i just like when you're a kid you just like shit you know it's not you don't have an identity yet you know you're not like a teenager yeah. where you're like i am this guy you know and it just never happened for me too much you know with that so thank you next hey thanks for being here um, I just wanted to know, I don't even know if you'd remember, but uh, after you made TOJ and wrote to it, do you remember, uh, it was it based on anything, or do you remember how you felt after writing it? Did you realize what you had made, or? Wait, what did I make? <laughs> <laughs> A pretty good track. Oh, yeah, I think as I realized it. I thought was like, yeah, it's a pretty good track. <laughs> I was a ba it was it was it was um it was written for a woman it was written for exactly <laughs> it was a love letter it was definitely just a direct love letter to somebody that 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 it didn't work out with um I had a very complicated fucking heartbreaking relationship who with someone who I'm still very close with now I think one of the reasons why we're still close is because I wrote that song and I sent it to her and um you know so I felt um You know, it's interesting in those situations when you're writing something that, that um, I mean, you know, no bullshit, man. Writing something down like that, getting something recorded, that's the other thing. It's like, it's kind of over, <laughs> you know? When, you know, if you're hurt, if you're, or if you're pissed, or if, you're, or, or if you've got something that you don't understand, if you can get that shit down, if you can get that down and out, you know, You kind of contained it. It's like you 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 you've you've put it in a cage and you own it now, and it's and 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 it's there and it exists and it will always be there if you want to feel that again or go to it again. But you don't have to carry it around anymore. You've you've taken it, you put it somewhere, and it, and it, and it has a home now. And and you know, and that home is not in you all the time. And that, and so I think I felt relief, to be honest. You know, getting something out like that where where it's like a a true um, translation of how you feel. It's 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 tough and it's mostly scary to even do it because you start thinking about people listening to it. So I thinking like, well, people are going to hear this, but you know, you got to keep the audience out of the process. You can't the audience does not exist when you make music. It just cannot. Um you're the audience. And so um so I think I probably felt a great deal of relief. And I would imagine that's how you felt when you did, you know, last good sleep as well. Yeah, I did last good sleep. I played it for my mom. She fucking cried you know um and uh you know i hugged her and i was like it's over <laughs> you know and it was i mean you know last good sleep was re was the, the the whole thing was not just a concept i mean i was having nightmares i was for years for years and years and years and years i had i had these real nightmares um and i would even go so far as to like think that i saw my ex-stepfather on the street and chase him down subway platforms and through subways trying to trying to catch him and it just not being him and shit like that you know i was i was uh i was a little fucked up and um so yeah that song that was the first time i had experienced that so i guess i kind of just i kind of once i caught on to that trick i was like you know this is something i can do you know 
Who else? Hi there. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Um, uh, for my taste, uh, I really like experimental hip hop and anti pop course consortium. It was huge for me back yeah. then. And uh, lately, maybe Samaya and All Brain Feeder stuff and the kids at Odd Future, it's so refreshing. Yeah. And I just want to know your thoughts about it and um, how how is uh, hip hop developing and what do you think it will be in a few years? I don't know. Um, just some thoughts. Just, just, uh, it's just, it's first of all, it's probably just going to be telepathic. That's what I'm guessing. Ten years. Uh, all battles will be filmed, just two people standing in a room looking at each other. <laughs> but, I mean, anti pop Consortium, you mentioned them, I, I, that's, those are my boys, like I came up with them. Like we're from the same, exact same, you know. I, I mean, like I love everything, man. I love good music. All, it, I, don't, I, I don't define myself as liking experimental stuff, and it's fine if you do, because you, you're putting a name to it, that's cool. But for me, I just like records. Uh, anyone can come up with a record that I like. Anyone can surprise me. Um, I'm open to it, you know? I want to hear something that makes me turn my head, you know? Something that makes me go like this, something that makes me, uh, you know, excited about music. So I, honestly, I, I'm, I am sup like super amped when anybody comes out that's doing something exciting and has that energy, you know? That's how I felt when Odd Future came out. I was totally amped about that because I, that's important, man. We all need that, you know? Uh, we always need that dose, you know? We need... The balance we need people who come out who are just not really paying attention to whatever you know that are, that are being of their own voice and so i feel the same way i just don't you know i just don't have a um anything one specific thing that i i look for anymore you know yeah even i remember this past year um you know touching on the point that we spoke on earlier uh in terms of audience expectation or you know being pigeonholed into to being representing one style versus another uh asap yams had tw had had tweeted out like sometime last year about how uh you know kids who are buying def jux albums or who are company flow fans are not buying you know asap rocky records and and you responded uh, i i'm in company flow and i'm a fan you know so it is something, you know, occasionally that comes up still. Yeah, but, and I think that we all have to, you know, we're all, we all deal with it in our own way. And then we're all still something that we're all, as a community, grapple with, you know, identity, the way that you look at yourself versus the way, you know, a lot of people compare the, the way that they're looked at to the way that other people are looked at or their perception of the way that other people are looked at. And, you know, and, you know, it's not, there's no, there, you know, there's no, there's no just, sweeping it out of the rug there's still those 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 conversations still happen i just don't think it's as um i mean my point my, my point saying that to him was that i maybe he was was actually to reassure him <laughs> you know it was like look man you know that's not you know that like i understand you feel that way but if it makes any difference you know like the guy that is in the group that you're saying people don't listen to listens to you so you know I, I I believe um wholeheartedly in 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 um in uh healing of those types of ideas you know I, I don't think that those types of ideas do anyone a it's like everyone should definitely do them and definitely be out for them and try and be trying to be making their point and their statement but you know you might be surprised like you know I've learned, one thing I've learned is like you never know who fucking is into your shit you never know who listens to your shit you have no idea you meet people and you maybe hated their band <laughs> you know you meet you meet some people and you talk shit about them because you didn't like their music you hated their shit you know and not even in your genre you know you meet like some rock band and you you remember back to being like yeah look at that asshole you know and then you meet them and they're the coolest motherfucker in the world and they like your music and all of a sudden you're like, maybe I'm the asshole and maybe I shouldn't be thinking about this so much. Like, you know, so that, that you know, I've had, I've had one too many experiences like that to be, to, to, say, to, to say shit publicly like, 
you know, to, to be too critical or to be too vocal about anything at this point, music related, you know, except for things that I just feel like I have no connection to whatsoever. <laughs> you know, like, but anybody else? Anybody? Going once, going twice. It's a whole lot of whole lot of thoughts in his head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think there's nothing left to say except thanks to LP for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.